Chillin', man. Trying to be like you, man. I see you taking over the media game. Man, I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to do a little something. You know what I'm saying? You know, yeah. my ambition is to finally get a invite. In, nah. My ambition is to finally get invited to the goddamn co-sign <laughs> award show. It's, and, like, man, it's time, right? You know what I'm saying? This body, man. I'm trying to show up, get some accolades, at least one or two <laughs> nominations. I'm trying to take over. Say, like, man, I see you, man. You've been consistent already, man. I see you 2020, man. Hey, man, I'm, I'm trying to be there. You yeah. know what I'm saying? It's, it's black tie affair, right? It's all. Oh, yeah, black tie, man. Suited and booted, man. Man, I'm trying to, boy, I'm trying to clean up. <laughs> I said, you know what? This podcast is cool, but I was like, I need a co-sign mag. And then I see some people I, that was nominated for some shit. I was like, I'm way better than them. <laughs> yeah, I'll be getting that too. Man. I'm, I'm so trying, like, man. I'm like, trying. How you pick them? <laughs> nah. I'm trying, man. We're going to get there, though. But co-sign magazine, man, definitely a staple in the culture here. You know, um, you know what I'm saying? Would you consider it as a digital or are you still doing print with it too? Yeah, we still print. We print quarterly, man. So four times a year. Um, you know, everything is digital right now. But for me, I think... The print magazine kind of separates us from everybody. Yeah. Still having that tangible item, so we, we, we'll forever print. I mean, it's expensive, mm -hmm. but you know, it just kind of separates us from everybody else, man. So I'm, I'm gonna keep do, I'm gonna keep that alive. Okay. And so for those who not familiar with Co-Sign Magazine, kind of yeah. give us like, what's your mission statement? What y'all do? What it's about? Yeah, man. So uh, so Co-Sign is a is a media platform publication uh, and actually marketing agent as well, man. Um, so what we do at Co-Sign is our job is to tell stories of entrepreneurs, creatives influencers, artists, et cetera, um, and why we co-sign them, why we support them, and also figure out who they co-sign and support. So I always tell people, man, it's like, no matter what industry you're in, right, you need kind of that stamp of approval, that vouch. So with co-sign, what we're trying to do is get behind those entrepreneurs and creatives early and those artists early, give them that, you know, that stamp, and help them, you know, catapult to the next level of their careers. Let's start back from the beginning, man. That's what Mogul State of Mind is about. It's right. about getting that story and Not leading sure. up to the accolade. So. KG, where you from, man, and how did it, you end up getting into your field? Man, it's, it's a long story, man, but I'm going to try to condense everything, right? No, man, so, take your time. Yeah, man, so uh, both my parents are originally from the country of Panama, right? So they moved to the States when they're 21. They moved okay. to Brooklyn. Uh, so that's where they conceived me and my sister. So I was born in Brooklyn. Um, they didn't even have no money, so my dad was able to join the U.S. Army, even though he was Panamanian. Okay. So that got them their citizenship. So he joined the U.S. Army, moved around, got to Texas. Um, and we ended up getting stationed in Fort Hood, which is like two hours from here, like two and a half hours in Killeen, Texas. Okay. So that's kind of where like I grew up, you know what I'm saying, middle school, high school, played ball there. But as soon as I turned 17, I'm like, I'm out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I could see like there was no growth there, you know what I'm saying? So I'm out. So 17, I moved out here. Uh, but unfortunately, as soon as I turned 18, I got in some trouble. So that kind of killed like, you know. Trouble like what? You can't. Can you share? Where? Yeah, yeah, I can share, man. So it was at the time, uh, you remember when, uh, what was it, Hurricane Katrina was yeah. out here? So like a lot of people moved here from New Orleans, and uh, there was like a lot of different hustling activities, like I could make money doing one. So I, had, I was working at Dillard's, and um, a girl that was working there, she like she put me on to what she was doing. So it was like, man, we were changing tags, you know what I'm saying? Nah. So like, you get a polo shirt, it's $100. But we'll put it like a, a some socks on the tag. <laughs> oh shit. So it's like two dollars. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So we ringing up people, you know what I'm saying? Junk load full of clothes, maybe worth a couple thousand, but we give it, you know, but it rings up like twenty two dollars. You get what I'm saying? Damn. We tell them whatever the sticker price is, you gotta give us half of that in cash. You know what I'm saying? Got you. So we was doing that for a minute, like I ain't gonna lie, I was eating. I was eating real good. And then one day, I'm not gonna lie, I didn't really feel like doing it, but she was like, Yo, I got this lick, I really need your help. So what I didn't know was, I didn't know she messed up. So what she did was she took all the clothes to the closet and she was there for like 45 minutes. So they started watching her, see what she was doing for 45 minutes. And then she took all the clothes back to the register. And then she called me to come over there. So when she called me over there, they zoom in on the register and they seeing shirt, $1.99, $1.99. Oh, damn. You know what I'm saying? So then they send, you know, like the, you know, like that, uh, the short, the stop, the short, the secret shopper dude. Yeah, you know the security fake security, security friend, you know what I'm saying? Pull up, they look at the monitor, and then uh, two more come, and they take her, and they were like, let me see the receipt. So I'm like, I give him the receipt, and then they were like, you got to come with us. So I'm like, man, I come with them. So they asked me all these questions, did you know, I'm like, I'm not saying nothing, I'm not saying nothing, I'm not saying nothing. And I guess she ended up saying everything. Uh. And then like 15 minutes later, Arlington PD came, uh, Read me my rights, you know what I'm saying, whatever. Took me down to Arlington PD. And then, you know, I was so young and I didn't really, I didn't really know too much. So, you know, when you, when you 
when you go to jail, you only got to pay 10% or whatever. Right. So I get one phone call. I'm calling all my homies like, bro, you know, my joint's like, I think it was like 2500 so I'm like, I gotta put twenty five hundred dollars together. Really, I only had to do like two fifty. Right. <laughs> but you know, they they scrounging. You know, they seventeen, eighteen. They scrounging trying to get twenty five hundred dollars. So they finally get it by like three, four in the morning. By the time they come get me, it's like six. I'm like, man, I spent you know basically the whole night there, man. And then after that, you know, I wasn't able to get like a, a job because you know that was on my record. I was eighteen, so that was on my record. So um, luckily, I was blessed enough to have a cousin who was an entrepreneur, KD, KD's Custom Jewelry. At the time, he was only doing grills. So, um, like, it's crazy because doing grills is what actually introduced me to, like, this whole Dallas culture. You right. know what I'm saying? Um, he was real cool, Big Tuck. So, doing grills, I got cool with DSR. Um, I actually got a song with Fat Bad. I used to rap. <laughs> I got a song with Fat B. You know what I'm saying? So, it was like, man, like, that grills actually introduced me to everybody. I ended up meeting um, Julia Beverly from Ozone Magazine. Okay. Right? And I started seeing that magazine everywhere. Once I read it, I'm like, man, this is really cool. Like, when I was going to school, I was going to school for psychology. So, you know, I like to figure out what people think and why they do what they do, but I didn't want to do it for eight years. So I figured journalism is the next thing. Like, I get to interview people, hear their stories, and kind of critique that. So um, I shot my shot with her, emailed her, and, um, you know, she sent me another email. So I reached out to this lady. I reached out to her, and she's like, we're going to start you as a field marketing position. You know what I'm saying? We're going to mail you a box of Ozone magazines, go to events, take pictures, have people take pictures with them, have celebrities take pictures with them, submit it to us, we'll feature some. So I'm young and hungry, so I'm going to every event, Dallas, clean, also no matter where it's at, I'm going to every event, getting pictures taken, all my photos getting posted, and then I just started writing. One of them got published, but it wasn't consistently, man. I'm like, man, I want to do it consistently. So um, Ozone was kind of getting on the, dec- on the decline. Okay. And then I ended up having my daughter. So I'm like, man, I'm, I'm broke. Grills was on a decline too. So I'm like, man, I don't really know what to do. And luckily, uh, my dad was working overseas as a civilian contractor in Afghanistan. Oh, damn. And, uh, and records didn't matter. As long as you didn't have like a felony, you can go like class A misdemeanor, which I had, it wasn't tripping off of. So I said I can go over there. So I'm like, bet. So I went to Afghanistan for, for two years. Damn, what was that like? Crazy. So, so you're like, you're, you're with the military, but you don't get no protection. You can't leave the base. So you're on like this small compound all day with nothing but men. Except Damn. the women soldiers, but you can't fraternize with the women soldiers. So you're there, and then you can, you can only go home every four to five months. So I'm stuck on this compound for five months with nothing but men, working 12-hour shifts, seven days a week. You know what I'm saying? But the money was good. Good. So and then like, you couldn't blow it. Yeah, you, you just nothing to do. And they feed you, they house you, everything. So you're not spending no money out there. So like, you can go off, you can go over there, literally, you can go over there and scoop ice cream and make six figures a year. Damn. Yeah, man. So I was making six figures a year, um, but I was like, a, uh, I was a foreman over there, uh, over like the warehouse. Okay. Making six figures, bro. Um, Send my money back home to my daughter. And then after that, I'm just saving. So I saved all that money for two years and came back. I was like, I really don't want to work now. And then uh, I was like, I'm going to start my own magazine. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know the ins and outs. So I couldn't think of a name. I'm thinking of some whack names like, like, like showcase magazines, all, all, <laughs> whack, all types of whack stuff. And my older sister, she needed a new car. She was like, man, uh, can you co-sign a car for me? I'm like, Zee, I love you, but I don't really mess with you like that. So you know what I'm saying? Right. Put my name on yeah, the car. Well. Then it just hit me. It's like, man, all these artists, photographers, they all need that co-sign. You know what I'm saying? Entrepreneurs need that co-sign like, just to kind of help them, give them that, that, that push. And I'm like, man, that's what I want to do for my magazine. So that's kind of where the whole name co-sign started from. And then uh, from there, I just came back to Dallas. and. Utilized all my contacts that I got from when I was doing grills and everybody my cousin knew when I was at every hip hop showcase, every open mic, every fashion show, uh, talking about cosign, taking pictures, and just you know spreading the, spreading the brand.